my name's Owen. I'm the head cheese maturer at Neil's Yard Dairy. There's a famous story which most people in this courtyard have probably heard. It concerns a bishop, a cathedral under construction, and a couple of stonemasons. This is not it. A bishop was building a new cathedral. On a site visit, the churchman stopped to ask a stonemason what he was doing. I'm building a wall, Father. And as he was concentrating on his work and paying attention to the details, he was doing a very nice job, straight and true. A little later, the bishop asked another mason what he was doing. I'm building a cathedral, Father. But his wall was wobbly and unlikely to stand the test of time. He was distracted by visions of soaring spires, great ecclesiastical events. My boss told me this story some years ago, and I often think of it. Is that better? It's a bit booby. And I often think of it. I like its contrary and uncooperative rejection of a certain way of thinking. I also think it makes a very good point. In my early days as a cheesemonger, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> In my early days as a cheesemonger, I learned how to remove the cloth from a cheddar. We always did this when we cut the cheese. It meant that a lot of the smudgy, mighty, moldy debris was kept away from the cheese counter and it made the operation a lot more manageable. After many repetitions, I became very quick at removing the cloth. I simply scored right through it with the heel of a sharp knife, flipped the cheese over and did the other side. Then I set my jaw in a determined fashion um, and hauled the cloth off the cheese. Job done, lickety spit. When I came to Neil's Yard Dairy, I learned another way. I still scored it and I whipped the cloth off where appropriate, but generally we would leave most of the cloth on. It looked nice, and after all, the cloth is there to protect the cheese. Why remove it until you absolutely have to? If you can keep your work area clean, despite the debris and smudge from the cheesecloth, it's more sensible to leave it on. Time passed quickly. Soon it was Christmas number whatever, for me at the dairy, we were selling more and more cheese than ever. As well as cutting and displaying the cheese in our own shops, we were now selling more and more cheese on wholesale and quartering a lot of cheddar to send abroad, particularly to France. I learned another way of removing the cloth. This time, it was more like carefully undressing a cheese than surgically cutting the clothes off and slicing into the flesh as I went. Layer by layer, you unwind the cloths that have been so carefully applied. You can see much more clearly the work of the cheesemaker, and if you're paying attention, you can learn all sorts of things about what is happening during the make and what has been going on in the maturing rooms. How well has the cloth bonded to the cheese? How well has the surface of the cheese knitted in the press? Has the mold penetrated the surface, followed by the mite? And why has this only happened at one end of the cheese? I'm not saying that this is the best way to remove the cloth. It may be more appropriate to score and strip than to undress the cheese. And sometimes you may want to take the whole cloth off as it's much easier to maintain the cleanliness and the organization of your cheese counter. The decision you make depends upon the situation you're in. And hopefully you've accumulated enough skill and judgment as a cheesemonger to respond to the situation. I am in the fortunate position of managing a stock of some really terrific cheese. However, that does not mean it's plain sailing. There are constant problems. Some of the problems are of our own making and some are not. Broadly speaking, the problems we create for ourselves stem from misjudging stock levels, screwing up maturing, and sending people the wrong cheese. Those stemming from others are usually make quality although we see plenty of difficulty due to logistics and transport. Several years ago, we learned a precious lesson. We had a stilton problem. 
We knew that our sales at Christmas would exceed what we could provide if we let them. Therefore, we needed to prepare people for the idea that we might not have enough Stilton for Christmas. They would need to plan ahead to secure their Christmas Stilton from us, and we could help them to do that. We could help them. So, sorry, so effective were we at conveying the first part of this message that a large number of customers immediately changed supplier. <laughs> Quite quickly, we found our own stock spiraling upwards. We did not respond quickly enough to the sharp decline in sales, not by replacing those lost sales, not by reducing our stock, and not by taking the cheese off our shelves and reducing the temperature dramatically. We simply did not notice in time. Nothing could have been further from our minds than being overstocked with Stilton. The cheese ripened far beyond what we were anticipating and far more quickly. We had to dispose of a ton of cheese at a truly ridiculous price. These days, we watch our sales much more intently. And having learned other lessons as well since then, we might approach the overstock of overripe cheese differently too. There are more ways than one to skin a cat. Obviously, we would expect to notice much sooner that there is a problem and move the cheese to the appropriate conditions. We would enlist the help of our three shops and our market stall. They have shown themselves to be extremely effective at leading the charge in addressing a major issue. And we might try to change the nature of the problem into something more interesting by making some deliberately questionable maturing decisions. Life is just more fun like that. <laughs> One of the things we know is that the better a cheese is, the more of it we will sell. This fact is constantly demonstrated to us, and it shows that, qual that, quant sorry, that quality has a real quantifiable value. Quality generates confidence, and confidence allows you to speak with clarity, knowing in your heart that there is every reason for someone to want to buy this cheese, and that having tasted it, they will want more. When you're confident, you will hand a piece of cheese to your customer, look them straight in the eye, and ask, isn't that great, knowing that their answer will be yes. Equally, if you're selling to trade customers of the telephone, and therefore cannot give them a piece of cheese to taste while you talk, that confidence is absolutely critical. As trade sales are about 80% of our business, you can see how important confidence is to us. All of that confidence is based on knowing that the quality of the cheese we're selling is good enough to make people come back for more, even in the face of the excellent cheese that our competitors are selling. One part of my job is to help to give our sales teams that confidence, to show them the cheese, to provide context, and to make sure that if something extra special is required for a particular market or customer or occasion, it is provided. We have many different markets. For example, our own shops, those shops and restaurants that we sell to in the UK, those to whom we export in Europe, the US, and all over the world. There are different travel times depending on where the cheese is being sent and how it's being sent, by boat, or plane, or lorry. We need to send the appropriate cheese to each one. Sometimes we fail, but always we have to try. In each market, there are some very special customers. Those whose sales increase when they receive a cheese that is especially good. It's our job to provide those people with the best that we can find. They are at the heart of our market, and they are the people to whom we need to devote most attention. These people can tell instantly if we lack confidence in what we're selling, they know the right questions to ask and hone in immediately on any reservation we may have about a particular cheese. These customers are at the center of any of our markets. Why are they so central? Because not only do they respond to the quality of the cheese, they're also prepared to work with less than perfect cheese. 
They understand the challenges we all face in this work, not least how many variables need to be controlled or managed or managed, sorry, to produce an excellent cheese repeatedly. They also understand that while working towards producing a great cheese, there will be a period during which the cheese is not great. They will work with this cheese if they can be confident that it is on a path which will lead to very good cheese in the end, just as we do. They ask questions. It's been amazing recently. What's going on? Has the milk changed? Are they using a different starter? Are you overstocked? And is that the reason the cheese is tasting a little tired? Is the drying room broken? They provide important information. The cheese is arriving in an inappropriate condition. Is there a problem with the transport company? Or it discolors only after only a day, it's only a day after it's been cut. Or it's sublime, the rind is amazing. They point us in the direction of more interesting customers and introduce us to other interesting suppliers and producers. They help us to solve our quality problems, our supply problems, and our logistical problems. Each of these areas I've addressed is very important as we build our particular cathedral. Detail and craftsmanship, mistakes, and how we ensure that we learn from them. <laughs> Confidence in its value and what our key customers mean to us. Many of my walls have collapsed after I've built them, but I have learned far more rebuilding them after they have fallen than I ever would have if they had stood first time around. Thank you. Now, if I may, I'd like to introduce my, my friend and colleague, Martin Tikales. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, can you all hear me? That's better. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, and thanks to Betty Costa for saying, giving that talk earlier to everybody. Thank you, much appreciated. Many months of hard work gone into this moment. We're not gonna let it get spoiled, are we? Thank you, everybody. Okay, so, my name is Martin Tikales. I'm the borough shop manager for New Yard Dairy in London. I want to talk about helping our customers know about the kinds of problems that Owen and Co encounter and how we can work with those things and hopefully use them for inspiration for ourselves and our customers too. Owen is at the point of contact between maker and maturer. He has a great deal of responsibility and some control over how to avoid those problems and or how to live with them. I am a representative of our cheesemakers and maturers to the public, and I want to do right by all of them. It's my job to help educate customers into our way of thinking. I believe it's good for any food industry to have confident, willing, and excited customers who are looking out for greatness. Our customers help keep our edge as a business. Correspondingly, the weight of the farmhouse cheese industry provides the pressure to engage those customers. That position makes us really, every day, explore strange philosophical tangents in between tasting cheese, selling cheese, looking at cheesy spreadsheets, and hopefully putting some money in the bank. I believe that within our own organization, we have to be open-minded to those discussions and flexible enough to test ourselves against them so we can offer our customers the opportunity to taste, to buy and support some of the world's most exciting flavours made right now and those yet to be made. Sometimes we take excellence and brilliance for granted. We do so much work behind the scenes and most of our customers will not notice it. I'm interested in the truth of the changing cheese landscape. I'm not that interested in a vision of perfection or of working in a museum. Sometimes you might risk fooling our customers that everything is stable and fine all of the time and fooling ourselves with the same thing, that cheese is a constant. Cheese is not a constant. To quote a cheese maturing friend of mine, cheese is a right bastard. 
Just when you think you've got it mastered, something else comes along and changes everything. Over the course of many years of working at Neil's Yard Dairy, and with Owen in particular, we have both grappled with the same absurd and circular arguments, time and again, on a weekly basis. Typically at 7.30 or Wednesday mornings, you'll find us. We do battle sometimes, sometimes against each other, sometimes in defense of a cheese together, sometimes with a burning agenda or a point to prove. This is called a walkthrough in our business. And it means we talk and walk through our warehouse, examine the cheeses and our own ideas. It's one of the engines of progress for Neil's Yard Dairy, that's for our business. And this is where sales and maturation meet. That's where Owen and I do our horse trading. At a designated time each week, the sales teams get together with the maturers in a series of small rooms underneath a busy railway line to taste and discuss cheese, to negotiate and to plan sales. The interesting part is the mid-game. It's not really the opening moves of observation of flavor that that's important. The interesting part for me is how you wrap up the aim of the cheesemaker, the cheese, the climate in the shops, and how you take that aim and you try to act upon it. It takes a bit of time, experience, and imagination to forget about your urban and industrial surroundings and to think about the whole chain of cheese production in one whole thought and see what you need to do and how to execute those plans in the shop. And those plans are untested until the system and the will to act with cheese encounters people, our customers, who may or may not buy that cheese. Something that confuses me all the time and confuses us in our company is a theory that cheese can be terrible and inspirational at the same time. It's a great lesson, but it also acts as an obstacle in deciding how to act. The great thing about customer interaction with our cheese is that it adds a whole liberating dimension to the puzzle. And of course, it places challenges on our system. It's liberating because we talk at length, on and on and on, about the ancient question, what makes a good cheese? So often, if you put that conversation and that cheese in front of a customer while you're debating it and ask them, they tend to say, I don't care about that, but I'll take half a kilo. And that's mostly a problem solved. Sometimes in our organization, we forget that we're on the same side. On your side, our counterparts, and the side of our producers and our customer side too. Owen mentioned difficulties of logistics and distribution either the wrong amount of cheese or it's in a wrong place. Those things you can sort out by any means you can, and often it comes down to money, and money does not have feelings. Quality issues are thorny and take time. Where we come in as retailers is by asking the question, what do we present to our customers? I mentioned pressure earlier, because we are allowed to pick and choose the easiest cheese to sell but that alone is not our company, and it's not what I'm interested in. At that cheese meeting, Owen has to twist our arm and challenge us quite a bit, using many different devious psychological techniques <laughs> in order for everything to keep moving through and for everyone to go home with something. I recently spent a few hours over a couple of days helping an old friend with his new shop. It sells many delicious things to eat and to drink, including some cheese. He's one of our wholesale customers, and he's already doing remarkably well. I was happy to turn up and just play shopkeeper, because I'm a weirdo like that, on a couple of days off. It was fun. He has a great place to shop and to work, and he has excellent cheese. That being my field, I took it upon myself to sell cheese to his customers. Cheese from Crevero, Cheese from Mons, from Lamuse, and Neil's Art Dairy, principally. The wines, beers, jars of things on the shelves were all fine and delicious, but not everything was so good in the cheese counter. I was going through his counter, as we all do, and thinking, oh dear, we have to do something about this. You see, it was a very warm day and a bit too warm for some of the cheeses. Both soft and hard would begin to suffer, but tasted amazing. Still the best cheese in many miles radius. 
So I engaged some customers. We tried the cheese and we quickly sold those things that were delicious and that needed to be consumed. And my friend's customers loved them. After we had accomplished that, I looked down at the greatly reduced range. We were rid of the problem cheese at full price. But I was so sad as we only had pretty good, pretty perfect cheese left. And where's the fun in that? <laughs> as a cheesemonger, I love the really bad, I love the really amazing. But I find it really hard to feel anything about the it's just okay cheese. Right there was a perfect scenario for any shopkeeper, but it did not make me happy. That's a very strange message to tell your producers, but I'm also a very strange kind of cheesemonger. I'm trying to constantly improve how we work with our customers. I just see more things to improve, and if I get excited by them, so might our customers. Do our customers still see us as a destination in London for British and Irish farmhouse cheese? I think that more and more at the moment, and my answer is to go back to the trial and error of farmhouse cheese development. I'll put it bluntly, I'm a little worried that we are so used to only the very best as an organisation, so when we face issues we don't have any memory or muscle memory to remember how to act. This is an age-old problem. We need to welcome some weakness and insecurity and use them both to keep active. And this really is how progress is made, in my mind. You become weak without weakness. Right now, with the developed landscape of cheese all around us, we're all pushing towards the best cheese. If you don't improve, you only stay average. The quest for improvement is dangerous because it allows mistakes, costly, ugly mistakes. Who decides which mistake is adding value? And who decides when we ask for a credit? It's not the action that's hard or the execution. It's, of course, the decision to act for the most part. Because you want to do the right thing, and it takes a long time to reach the right decision. The true mistake is not engaging with problems. In our organization, we have to have a split personality. We have to walk down the two roads. We have to be discerning and generous at the same time. My method when I think that we are driving ourselves crazy, and I always think that, is just to ask our customers to join in on the dialogue. Many people sample out. Very few people engage their customers. We have adventurous customers who want the best, but are also interested in the most interesting, non-perfect cheese, with all the baggage and explanation that goes along with that. Sometimes you have to introduce the concept of improvement to our customers. Many people want to get their cheese and just get out of the shop as quickly as possible. What we could work on is how to gently introduce this debate to our customers without putting them off. You owe it to them to actually challenge them in the most delicate way. Because if we don't trust them to learn and develop the cheese, the cheese will eventually get boring and they will stop coming. I spent a lot of time building a strong foundation in my team so that the unpredictability of cheese can just wander in and playfully undermine our cathedral. Sometimes it comes crashing in and we struggle to handle that. How do you prepare your teams and your people? It upsets and it stresses your staff when you don't show them that a problem can be a great thing and they need to be open-minded and fair. Years ago, I was opening the borough shop and I was displaying the cheese, not very well. My manager at the time, John Thrupp, who's here today, when I thought I was finished, looked at my work, and when he was dissatisfied, he don't want to upset John, uh, he picked up a moldy, ugly, cracked piece of cheese, and he said, you don't like this cheese very much, do you? And I said, no, maybe I don't. And he said, from now on, any bits like this, you don't just abandon them like that. You need to present them as best you can. Clean them up. Just let someone else take over if you can't help. Don't leave them to die. Make no mistake, we handle some of the finest cheeses in the world, but sometimes they have bad days. If our producers follow their dreams and our recommendations, then quite often things go wrong before they go right. All those things that Owen has mentioned, 
are hard, profound, and occasionally tedious. Some people think the same of customer service. You're so patient with people. Why do you give out so many samples? Those customers took ages. Yes, we all feel that. Of course we do. So, sometimes I think more work goes into selling 100 grams of cheese than selling a whole house. But that's my craft. That's what are my walls in that cathedral and part of my duty. The reward is, is when our customers enjoy the struggle and thank us for introducing them to something. I think that it's okay to show some weakness, but it's fine to acknowledge difficulty. If we're to further farmhouse cheese, because it's unfinished and ever-changing, in whatever field, scientific, craft-based, animal husbandry, we who sell cheese need to be ready and happy to trust ourselves and our customers and to open up those dialogues. And I fear if we don't do this, we'll all get left behind. Those are my thoughts and my plans for the future. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming today. And above all, I'd like to thank the Cravero family for the incredible hospitality. And lastly, before I go, I'd like to invite you all to partake in some exceptional raclette which is being prepared next door. Thank you very much for your time.